Our next presenter is Melissa Hartwig. Melissa is a certified sports nutritionist who specializes in helping people change their relationship with food and create lifelong healthy habits. Her and her husband, Dallas, have co-created the Whole30 program, which helps support over a million people every month, making lasting lifestyle changes. They've also teamed to co-author and write New York Times best-selling book, It Starts With Food. Melissa has been an integral part to Paleo FX since day one, year one. Um, I'm just grateful that she's been yeah, choosing us, if you will, uh, all these years. And, and uh, please help me welcome her and support Melissa Hartwig. Thank you. Thank you so much. So changing your lifestyle with a paleo style diet or a Whole30 program is challenging. You have to think about what you're gonna eat for breakfast if you're not having cereal, or what you're gonna do when you go out with colleagues for happy hour. We tell people planning and preparation are key, and most people take that to heart when it comes to their food. But food isn't the only thing that changes when you take on this kind of lifestyle adventure, because food isn't just food. When it comes to your relationships, food is comfort. It's love, it's acceptance, it's bonding, and food is highly emotional. It's far more emotional than something like exercise, meditation, or other things people may take on in an, in an in, uh, intention to improve their health. Often, our relationships with other people change as a result of us changing the food that we put on our plate. And often, it's not in a positive way. So we may be surprised by some of the negative feedback, the criticism, the questions. It may throw us off our game, making us feel alone or defensive, so much so that we may abandon our healthy eating efforts just to keep the peace. The good news is you don't have to decide between having good, healthy relationships with the people you love and making yourself healthier with a paleo or Whole30 style diet. So today, let's talk about how to talk about food with friends, family, and coworkers in a way that won't get you divorced, defriended, or fired. The first thing you're going to have to learn how to do is explain to people what you're doing. So whether you do that in advance, whether you're thinking about doing a Whole30 or switching to Paleo, or at some point in the middle, somebody notices what you're doing and says, hey, what are you doing? You need to have a plan for how you're going to discuss this. Your initial goal with this conversation is simply to have a positive and open interaction, one that promotes dialogue. It's not your job to inform them on every single aspect of a paleo lifestyle or a Whole30. Your job is just to open the dialogue and keep it very positive. So let's look at a scenario. Say you're at the office and your coworkers are going out for pizza and you always join them, but today you're doing the Whole30 so you decline and you pull out your Tupperware and you eat your lunch, and afterward a coworker says to you, hey, you didn't come out for pizza today, and your lunch looked totally different, and you didn't have a Diet Coke, and I never see you without a Diet Coke. What are you doing? There are a few ways to answer this question. If you don't have a plan, chances are what you're gonna come back with is something like, uh, oh, you know what, I'm not eating that stuff anymore. I'm not eating grains or dairy or added sugar. It turns out that stuff is really, really bad for you. That is not the best way to approach this conversation. Chances are, like there's a 97% chance the person you're talking to still has some of those things in their diet. And by coming out of the gate with saying, oh, I'm not doing that stuff, it's really bad for you, they may take that as a criticism or as judgment. And frankly, it sounds a little hypocritical, like, oh, I'm not eating that stuff anymore because yesterday they just watched you eat a sandwich, right? So that's not the kind of open dialogue we want to promote. We're going to scratch that attempt. The other thing you might say is something like, oh, I'm doing this new diet. I'm not eating uh, grains or dairy. Those things aren't allowed on the program. I also can't have any added sugar or alcohol. That's a more accurate representation of what you're doing, but we've chosen our words poorly here. For one, we've used some buzzwords that may have a negative connotation. I'm doing this new diet. That immediately springs to mind the latest fad diet, a weight loss plan, a quick fix, which immediately the person may discount as sort of just another kind of trendy thing that you're doing. And if they've watched you do this a bunch of times, if they've watched you get excited about a quick fix diet, do pretty well, 
fall off the wagon because the diet's not designed to be sustainable and then feel really bad about yourself and beat yourself up, they're probably not going to be very enthusiastic about this thing you're doing. You're also using words like, I can't have, I'm not allowed to have. And that makes it sound like you're not in control or taking control of your own health. Makes it sound like you're just following the rules set forth by this, these diet gurus. And for the duration of the program, you're just going to be white knuckling your way through it. It's going to be miserable. There's going to be a lot of deprivation. Again, that's not the kind of open and positive dialogue you want to have. So here is our plan. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to watch our words not use buzzwords that may have a negative connotation. We're going to keep it positive, focusing on the things we are eating, and we're going to include something personal. Remember, this conversation is designed to further your relationship with this person. So include something personal and something authentic. Make it as personable as your relationship with that person allows. So it sounds something like this. Um, you know, I've been having a really hard time with cravings lately. I feel like every day at 2 o'clock, I totally crash at my desk. I end up running to the break room. I eat candy. I drink a soda. It makes me feel really out of control with my food choices. And the rest of the day, I just feel like junk. And so I really want to try to take control of my cravings. I want to try to get back to a place of good energy. So I'm doing this health reset. I'm doing this kind of short-term health intervention where I'll be eating a lot of nutrient-dense, food and eating a lot more vegetables and fruit. See what we've just done there? We've emphasized that it's health. We've shared something personal. You know, I'm struggling with cravings. I'm struggling with energy. I really want to try to fix that. Um, we've made it an open conversation, an open dialogue. And there's a kind of a bonus thing that you can do here, which is make your sharing relatable. So if you're talking to a coworker who's largely sedentary and you say, you know, I hear this way of eating is really good for athletic performance. I'm going to try to cut five minutes off my 10K time. They're going to look at you and go, that's nice, but you're not fostering a dialogue there because that person can't contribute to that conversation. So think about who am I talking to and how can I share something personal in a way that's relatable? Maybe you know your coworker also struggles with cravings or with attention span in the afternoons, or maybe you know they also have allergies or migraines. Make what you share relatable so that you give the person an opportunity to contribute to that conversation. So you've kept it positive. You've explained what you're doing. You don't need to explain all the nitty gritty details here. This is just the initial intro. And then you've given them an opportunity to contribute. So maybe they come back and say, that sounds really interesting. You know, boy, you know I struggle with cravings at 2 o'clock too because I see you in the break room. Tell me a little bit more about what you're doing. So that's the initial conversation we want to have. And with some people, it may stop here, right? If it's just a business lunch, a casual acquaintance, this might be all there is. Maybe they ask you for more details. You explain what you're doing in a very healthy, positive way. But chances are the person you're talking to, maybe it's your best friend, maybe it's your family or a really close coworker, and you want to then recruit them to support you in this journey. You're not just sharing what you're doing, you're asking them for help. You want to enroll them in this change that you're making in your life because this isn't just a short-term venture, this is a new lifestyle that you're about to embark upon and you want to bring them in with you. So here's another situation, another you're sitting at the dinner table with your spouse and your kids. You've gone through this conversation in the way that I just described. It's very positive. It's very open. You've explained what you're doing, your personal reasons for wanting to do it. And now you want them to support you in this journey. A lot of people at this stage, they won't say anything. They'll think to themselves, well, they're my family. They love me. Aren't they automatically going to support me? They want me to be healthy. They want me to be happy. And yes, ideally that's the case, but there are reasons that the people closest to you may not be super excited and supportive, and we're going to talk about that next. In addition, they're not mind readers. You may sit down with your kids and say, hey, you know, mom's going to do this healthy eating thing, and they're going to go, do I have to do it? And you say, no, you don't have to do it right away, I'm going to do this on my own. And they go, okay, cool, but they don't know that you're asking something of them unless you have the conversation. So you have to have the conversation. One of the things that's very common when you're trying to do something that you know is going to be challenging is you ask people for help in terms of give me accountability. 
But there's a good way to do that and there's a wrong way to do that. So perhaps the conversation goes something like this. You know what, you guys, this is going to be really hard. It's going to be really hard for me for the next 30 days, so I need you to help me stick to it. I need you guys to help me stick to this. I really want to stick to it, and it's you guys are in charge of making sure that I do. I understand your intention here. You really want to, you're trying to bring them on board, make them a part of this, but you're asking them to do something that's really, really difficult. First of all, you make it sound as though your commitment is in their hands. And that is not at all the case. That's a lot of pressure to put on them, but you also need to understand that this commitment is to yourself and you need to be able to see it through with or without the support of your family. The other thing that this kind of uh, plea does is it puts them in a difficult position. So think about a time where maybe you said to a coworker or a family member, like, I'm having a really hard time with sugar. Like, I can't stop eating the Halloween candy. So I really want to stop eating the Halloween candy. So if you see my hand in the candy jar, I need you to just say, like, no, Melissa, you're not having candy. And your friend looks at you and says, do you really want me to do that? And you go, yes, I really, really want you to do that. You help me out here. What inevitably happens? At some point a week from now, my hand's in the candy jar and my friend comes over and says, Melissa, you said you weren't going to do that. And I get mad. I come up with like 700 reasons why I should be eating the candy right now. I justify it. I get defensive. I've earned it. I'm only going to have one piece. And now all of a sudden, this person is in a really tough spot. I've asked them to do something that I am now not allowing them to do. So let's have a conversation that actually ends in people getting on board with this change with you. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to explain the challenges, but in a very specific way. You know, you don't want them to think it's going to be all sunshine, rainbow, and ponies, but you want to be able to explain that these are some of the challenges. I've thought about the challenges. Here's how I have a plan to deal with them. You're going to tell them specifically what you need. So you're going to be asking for support from people, but that's going to look like different things depending on who you're talking to. The way your wife supports you is different than your kids, is different than your boss at work. And then finally, the missing piece, this is the one so many people leave off, ask for their help. Will you help me with this? Can I count on you to support me in this journey? That is how you enroll them. You make you make each other feel like you're kind of on the same team with this effort to improve your health. So here's what the conversation sounds like. Um, actually, I'm going to back it up because we have a bonus step. The bonus step in this, and this is something that people often miss as well, you want to let them know what's in it for them. This is how you really enroll people because, yes, they want to see you healthier, and that's a really great reason to support you all by itself. But if you explain that part of the reason you're taking on this healthy eating journey is so that you can be a better husband, a better father, a better friend, a better employee, that is really going to get them invested in this change. They're going to be touched. They're going to be honored that part of the reason that you want to be healthier is so that you can have a better relationship with this person. So I would actually open with that. I'm going to open with what's in it for you, how I've thought about it, and then talk about enrolling them in this change. So the conversation sounds like this. If you're sitting with your family, it's, you know, you guys, I get home from work every day at 5 o'clock, and I'm so tired. And I know you want me to play, and mom wants me to help with dinner, and I feel like all I do these days is sit for the for an hour and unwind, and that's because I have no energy at the end of my day. So I want to take on this healthy eating journey because when I get home from work, I want to have energy. I want to spend time playing with you. I want to help mom with dinner. I want to be there and active and engaged before you guys go to bed. And I think eating this way is really going to give me the energy I need to be able to spend more time with you. But it's going to be challenging. So when you guys are having movie night and you're all eating popcorn and M&Ms, it's going to be really, really tough for me not to want to join you in that. So here's what I need from you. Please don't offer me candy or junk food, even if you're joking. I know it would be really fun to leave an Oreo under my pillow. That is actually something I've heard somebody doing. Uh, I know it would be really fun to kind of tease me with some of these things, but honestly, it may be tough for me some days. And I've got a plan for how I'm going to handle it, but I'm just going to ask you, you know, don't offer me this stuff, even if you're joking, because I really, really want to stick to this plan, and I think that might make it difficult. That's what I need from you. Can you guys help me with this? Do you think you can support me as I really try to make myself healthier so that we can spend more time together as a family? Right? 
So see what we've done? We've taken the first half of the conversation, we've added on this idea of enrolling them in the change, and hopefully at this point, because you've said and done everything right, people are invested. The people you're close to, they know exactly what's expected of them. You've framed it in a very positive way, and hopefully at this point, they're on board. But as everybody knows, if you've had this conversation with people you're close to, not every response you get is going to be overwhelmingly positive. You may be met at any point in this discussion with criticism, questions, snarky comments, and that can really throw you if you aren't expecting them and if you don't know why they're happening. So what we're going to do is talk about some of the common reasons that people may criticize you for this healthy lifestyle change you want to make. Here's your general template. First of all, be prepared for it. It's going to happen. And it might happen from the people you're closest to, and that might really throw you for a loop. The people you think are the most likely to want to support you may be the ones who are most critical. It is almost always an emotional response. You are going to want to pelt them with the logic of your plan. No, no, this is really good because this book said this, and this diet said this, and here's a nutritional comparison. Very rarely will that actually work to open a dialogue because you're trying to answer an emotional response with logic, and that never works. So we're going to consider the emotional roots of this, and then throughout everything, I'm going to keep reminding you to focus on the friendship, on the relationship, and not on the food. So let's talk about what that looks like. The first, uh, oh, bonus, bonus, I keep forgetting about my bonus. Take care of you first. And this is something we'll talk about in the third example. You may find that your relationship with this person has taken you to a less healthy place in terms of your relationship with food. And if that's the case, you gotta take care of you first. Your responsibility is to your own health and happiness. And if the people in your life are not supportive of that, and through your best efforts, you can't work through that, it may be time to kind of fall back and limit your interaction with this person. So let's talk about some common reasons that people may be less than enthusiastic about this change. The first one is the easiest. This is the one that is actually the most logical and rational, and that is that people are just concerned for your health. Maybe they have a misconception about this way of eating. Maybe they feel like it's a quick fix, it's a fad. They're concerned about you eliminating entire food groups or won't you be missing out on key nutrients. Maybe they've watched you do this kind of yo-yo diet process in the past and they're just not excited about the you know, excitement and then crash and self-esteem hit that happens after you do these quick fixes. If this is literally just the concern, if they're just concerned for your health, then it's your job to explain to them how this is different from other things you've done in the past. So first, just thank them for caring. Wow, I really, you know, I can hear that you're concerned for me right now and I really appreciate that. Let's sit down and talk a little bit more about why I'm doing what I'm doing because I don't think I've done a very good job explaining it. Explain that this is not what you've done in the past. You're not doing this for weight loss. It's not a quick fix. These are the personal reasons that I want to take on this healthy eating venture and again, be authentic, make it as personal as is appropriate for your relationship with them. You know, it's far less effective to say to your mom, oh, I hear this is good for pain, than it is to say, every morning I wake up and my knee hurts so much, I can't go for a walk with my dog. And that really stinks, mom. That makes me really, un that makes me really unhappy, and I really think this way of eating is going to help with that. So make it personal. And then you can actually provide some logical, reassuring information. So sit down with the... Whole30 book and flip through some recipes and say, here's what I'll be eating. Doesn't this look amazing? There's no calorie counting. You know, there's no restriction on calories. Um, talk them through the nutrition that you'll be getting. There's a comparison and it starts with food of a Whole30 day versus a healthy day. And look, I'm going to be getting so many more micronutrients on this way of eating. And then stay connected with that person. Let them know as your journey goes on of the benefits you're seeing, of all of the things that are getting better, of the delicious food that you're eating. You know, with this one, you actually can provide them with information because their concern is strictly rational. Not so much for the next one. So another reason that people may be uh, less than enthusiastic is that they are feeling defensive. 
And you know, this kind of comes in the form of these snarky little comments, maybe a little passive aggressive jab. When I changed my diet back when I worked in an office and I would go into the office and sit down with coworkers, I had this one woman, she'd pull out her diet Mountain Dew and she would say, oh boy, Melissa, every time I pull out my diet Mountain Dew, you must be cringing. So you know, it's that kind of passive aggressive little jab, that little um, vibe. So the first thing, if this is what you suspect is happening with the people you're talking to, the first thing I would encourage you to do is look at your own behavior. Are you maybe, and your enthusiasm for this new way of eating, a little bit judgy? And I give you the benefit of the doubt. I know it's because you're enthusiastic. I know it's because you're experiencing all these amazing changes and you want everyone to feel like this. But maybe when she pulls out the diet soda, you've been saying stuff like, oh, are you still drinking soda? I really love this sparkling water that I have. Or, you know, Oh, don't you still have seasonal allergies? I don't know if you know this, but the bread you're eating could actually contribute to that. Like you're trying to be helpful and it comes from a good place, but that may put people on the defense. So if that's the situation, look at your own behavior. And if that is happening, just address it. You know what, you, man, I have been really excited about this way of eating and it, it kind of occurred to me that I'm getting a little bit preachy about it. I'm really sorry, you know, I'm not gonna do that anymore. Let's, let's just not talk about food over food. That's always a really good response. If you can honestly say, that's not my context, I've not been preachy, that's not how I've been doing it, understand that this is not your issue. You can make people feel bad about what they're doing just by rolling up to the lunch table, and it has nothing to do with you. You know, they're looking at your food, looking at their food, thinking, I know I should be doing better, I wanna be doing better, and yet they're not, and that may come out in the form of defensiveness. So if that's your situation, it's a really quick like one-two punch. You're gonna immediately deflect and immediately change the subject, and you're gonna do this as many times as is necessary to get the point across that you don't actually care what they're eating. Their food is none of your business and vice versa. So with the woman who was, um, the woman who was, uh, doing the diet soda thing with me, you know, she'd pull it out and she'd say, oh, every time I pull this out, you must cringe. And I would say, actually, I didn't even notice. How was that movie you went to last night? It's like fast. It's fast. You know, it's, oh, I, I didn't even notice. Or, oh, I'm just, you know, I'm just over here pulling my lunch out. No big deal. Like you deflect and you change the subject and you do that over and over until the person gets the hint that A, you're not going to engage because they want to engage you, right? It's a little passive aggressive in that they want you to kind of take a role in they're feeling defensive, but it's not your, what's the saying, not your circus, not your monkeys? So don't engage, change the subject, deflect, and move on. And that's how you deal with that situation. Another problem is that people may be feeling left behind or jealous when you start making healthy changes in your life. And this tends to come from the friend that you have bonded with over less healthy food. So like if there's, you know, there's a friend where like every time she has a bad day at work, you're more than happy to go out for drinks with her. Or every time you go to a restaurant, it's like, are you going to have dessert? I don't know. Are you going to have dessert? Well, I guess we can have dessert together. Like if you do it together, it doesn't count. And now all of a sudden, you're the one making these healthy changes. And she's worried that she's going to be left behind because one of the ways you've bonded is over food, you know, or... She sees you start to make these changes. People start to notice. They say, wow, you look great. Your skin is glowing. You seem so happy. What are you doing? And there's just plain old jealousy there. If that's the case, you know, you need to tread a little carefully here because this is a very emotional place to be. Focus on the friendship. Remind this person that you are still close. You still have things in common. You still love this person, even outside of food. You know, maybe it's like, Look, Sarah, if you have a bad day at work, I would, I'm still going to go out with you and listen and help as much as I can. And it doesn't really matter whether I have wine or sparkling water in my glass. I'm here for you, you know? I, I really enjoy those talks and I find it really helpful. So we're going to keep doing that. You may have to offer activities outside of food. If you find that every time you go out for brunch, the snarky remarks are coming, like, oh, no, Melissa's not going to have the French toast. She's too healthy now then you may need to just avoid the food situation altogether and find other ways to relate to this person. So maybe you suggest, oh, let's go get a pedicure, let's go shopping, let's go to the bookstore, let's go play some basketball, let's go for a hike. You know, it's a, it's a different context away from the heated subject of food. And then beware the intention, it's good intention, but beware the, the um, compulsion to say, 
well, if you did this with me, we could both be healthier. If you did this too, we could support each other. Because again, that may come off as aggressive. It may come off as critical or judgmental. Everyone has to come to this in their own time. And so if the person asks you a little bit more about what you're doing, certainly you can share. But honestly, the best way to handle this situation is just lead by quiet example. You know, knowing that this person is sensitive about food, they're not the right person to talk to about all of the great food you're eating or all of the great benefits. You know, we're not saying, saying you can't share a piece of that, but don't talk about it every single time you guys get together. Just lead by quiet example and let them come to you if and when they're ready. The last reason that people may be less than enthusiastic about this kind of lifestyle change is that they're feeling left behind. Uh, uh, feeling rejected, rather. And this tends to come from family. I see this a lot with moms or grandmas, where they have shown you love with food, and now that you're rejecting their food, you're not eating the chocolate chip cookies or the lasagna, they take it as a personal rejection of themselves. And this is, re you know, this is a very difficult place to be, because obviously this tends to come from the people that you're closest to. So again, what we're going to do in this situation, we're going to go back and really explain our personal reasons for not eating that particular food. And this is really important. Make it as personal as you can. You want to be authentic here. You really want to open yourself up, show a little vulnerability so that you can have a connection, a real connection with this person outside of the food. So maybe it's, you know, Mom, the other day I found myself eating potato chips while watching a movie and I ate the whole bag again. And this happens over and over and I just feel like I'm not in control of my food and it makes me feel so bad about myself. My self-esteem is just in the tank. So I'm doing this healthy eating effort in an attempt to control my cravings, but to do that, I really am avoiding sugar for the next 30 days. It's really important to me because I know if I eat your cookies, which I love, it's gonna make me wanna eat 10 cookies, and then I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna eat all the sweet stuff in my pantry, and then I'm gonna feel really bad about myself. So for the time being, I really just am gonna ask you, please don't make me cookies, because they're impossible for me to resist, and I really wanna see if I can change my relationship with food right now. Now is also a good time to suggest other things that you can do with this person that takes the place of the love they used to show you with food. So maybe if cooking is your mom's thing, maybe you can say, you know, I really, I'm not doing your lasagna right now because every time I eat dairy, I discover it makes my skin break out, but I really love your chicken piccata. And if I bring you over some ghee that's totally Whole30 compliant, can you make me, can you make that for me next Saturday? So you've kind of just given her another option of a way she can still show you love with food, but in a way that's appropriate for the healthy efforts that you're trying to take on. Or maybe, again, you do the same thing. You try socializing outside of food. You know, oh, mom, instead of coming over for dinner, why don't we go for a walk? Why don't we go for a hike? You know, why don't we go to the museum and look at the new art exhibit? The last thing that you want to do is stay really connected with this person. They're afraid that your rejection of their food is a rejection of them personally. So demonstrate to them that you are still very closely connected with them even though you're not eating her cookies. So maybe it's every morning, it's a text message check-in, like, hey mom, I'm doing really great, I'm feeling like my cravings are finally starting to get under control. Or it's an email with a picture of something you ate today. Or it's an update on the benefits that you're experiencing as a result of this lifestyle change. Or it's a note that just says, you know, mom, I, I know I came over last week and I know you wanted to make me cookies, but you didn't, and I really appreciate that. I feel so loved and supported and heard. Stay connected to let them know that your relationship transcends the idea of them feeding you this less healthy food. So really, if you've done all of this, if you've had the initial conversation, if you've recruited and enrolled their help, if you've had these maybe uh, in instances where you've had to handle criticism and you've handled it gracefully, you should be thinking, okay, all is well. Like, I've got people on board, I feel supported. But actions speak louder than words. And there are some things that you may be doing outside of conversation that are creating distance between you and the people closest to you. So let's look at some of the traps that you may fall into when you take on this kind of healthy eating that have nothing to do with conversations and everything to do with the way you're behaving and presenting yourself in the world. 
And I'm gonna hat tip to Dr. Anastasia Boulez here of Whole Nine South Pacific. She actually wrote a really great article about some of these concepts that I've adapted for this presentation. So the first thing that you might do is you might be a giant complainer. And maybe you don't even realize it, or maybe you think you're being funny, but you've had all these conversations with people at work, you've explained how positive this is and how excited you are and how wonderful it's gonna be, and then you sit down in every single staff meeting and they're eating bagels and you go, oh, I guess it's my carrot sticks again, yay. Or they go out for a happy hour and you go with them and you say, I would kill for a glass of wine. And this happens every time you go out. It's gonna be really difficult for them to believe your words when all they're seeing you do is complain about this effort that you're on. You're saying it's positive, but you're not acting like it. I'm not saying don't share the struggles or share the challenges. I'm just saying complain carefully. If you know there's someone who's only very tenuously on board with this plan, they are not the person to vent to. Find the right person to vent to. Share the challenges, but you can share challenges in a positive way too. You can say, man, I'm really having a hard time. You know, I'm watching all you guys enjoy your wine and it's really hard for me not to order. But then I think about how amazing I feel and how my energy is so much better. And it makes it pretty easy for me to stick to my sparkling water. So, you know, you're venting, you're sharing some of the issues, but you're doing so in a way that is not creating distance between you and the person you're speaking with. The second common thing is just being really preachy. And again, this tends to happen when you find something that you love that works so well, you just want the whole world to do it. So it's all you talk about. You talk about it with everybody, like the barista, your grocery store cashier, your best, everybody who knows you knows that you love Whole30, you love paleo, you love CrossFit, whatever it is. And being so preachy can actually create a lot of distance because again, everyone has to come to this in their own time. So people may start avoiding you, especially when it comes to social interaction where there will be less healthy food involved because they're afraid you're gonna give them a hard time. Like, oh boy, here comes Melissa, it's time for another Whole30 lecture. So just watch that behavior. I know your intentions are good, but understand that you can be enthusiastic in a way that is still quiet. So lead by quiet example. Just do what you do. If people ask you questions, answer them happily, keep it positive but don't try to shove it down anybody's throat because that's only going to create a separation between you and them. I call this one the awkward follower. This is where you talk about how awesome this is and you're really invested and you're really compliant, but you go out to um, lunch with people and the waiter passes the bread basket and you're like, no, I'm not gonna have any bread. I know it's totally weird, like everybody loves bread and like it's just bread, is bread really that bad for you? But I'm just not gonna have any, sorry, I know that's weird. And then everyone orders drinks and you say, oh, this is just, a, no thanks, I'm not gonna have wine, but I'm gonna have a sparkling, si uh, sparkling water and lime and I'm gonna pretend it's a vodka tonic, but it's not, but that's okay, I don't, I don't really mind. Like, like, you are making a really big deal out of this, and probably because you're feeling a little insecure, probably because you don't want to be like that person that makes everything so difficult, but by drawing so much attention to it, you're actually making it a big deal. So here's a little tip, like, if you don't make it a big deal, nobody else is going to make it a big deal. So, you know, you order, uh, the waiter passes the bread basket around, and you just say, no thanks. And people take your drink order and you just say, I'll have sparkling water, thanks. And that's it. It can be really simple. What you don't want is to get this impression that this way of eating or this healthy eating plan is like weird and socially isolating and makes it really difficult for you to be social because then what's gonna happen is people are going to A, not invite you to social events out of respect for you. They're gonna say, you know, oh well, it seems like this way is really difficult for her to socialize, so let's just not put her in that awkward position and they're not gonna wanna take this on. You know, there may be people in your life that you wanna take on this way of eating and they're not going to be willing to because they think it's gonna be really hard and awkward and difficult in social situations. So. You don't want to give that impression. Don't be that awkward follower. Just don't make a big deal about it, and nobody else will either. The last thing that may happen, and this may be kind of the most damaging of all in terms of your relationships, is that you turn into like a Whole30 hermit. You know, you're doing this program, you're still kind of new to it, you're not really sure what to do in social situations, how you're gonna, you know, avoid drinking when you're out with your colleagues at work, so you just don't go. They invite you to happy hour and you just pass. 
And you know, your mom wants you to come for the big family dinner, but you don't know how to talk to them about it, so you just pass. And you'd really love to you know, go try this new restaurant, and you've researched the menu, but you're still not really clear that you know what you're gonna eat, so you just don't go. And that's honestly the worst thing you can do. You know, this is not just a short-term intervention that you have to get through over the course of the next 30 days. This is the foundation for a healthy eating lifestyle that will last you forever. So you have to figure out how to take this out in the real world. You have to figure out how to integrate this with your relationships and social interactions. The other piece of this behavior is that socialization, in-person socialization, is such a powerful mediator of stress. And changing your way of eating like this can be very stressful. So isolating yourself while you're going through these changes, it's almost like you're denying yourself the very stress relief that you should be getting to help you through the transition. So I want you to take everything we've talked about today and all of these ideas about keeping it positive, setting a good example quietly, sharing personally and authentically your reasons for doing this, and take this out into the world. And embrace the fact that you can improve your relationships while you're improving the food you put on your plate in a way that actually brings you and the people you love closer together, not further apart. For more information on this topic, you can check out our new book, The Whole 30. We've built a whole lot of this kind of advice into The Whole 30, everything from how to do The Whole 30 on your own if you're the only one in your household, to how to deal with peer pressure, with things like alcohol or less healthy food. I also have a series on the Whole30 website called Dear Melissa, where people write in and ask me questions all about how to deal with Whole30 and life after your Whole30, including just eating a general paleo diet, um, with social situations, with challenging things like family events and vacations and holidays. You can connect with us on social media as well, um, and you can connect with me directly on Instagram. So that's all I have for today. We're gonna do some Q&A now. I think I got lipstick on the microphone. Hi, thanks. Hi. That's great. Um, I belong to a church. Hold it right up to your mouth. I belong to a church that is mostly vegetarian. Oh, and yeah. And they have really embraced Dr. Campbell and the China study and no fats and and they're all worried about me mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> um but i still want to be a part of the what's going on uh-huh and i don't know enough to be intelligent okay about it yeah i love so. that question so her her question is essentially you know i belong to a church where the majority of members are vegetarian and they practice kind of the opposite of the way that I'm eating now. You know, it's no animal products, it's very low fat, and they're all very concerned for me. And I'm not really sure, you know, I don't know if I know enough of the science to kind of rebut. Here's the thing I'm gonna tell you, lean on science very, very carefully, because you can find a study to support absolutely anything you wanna do, right? You look in the literature and like one day coffee will give you cancer and the next day coffee is really healthy. So, lean on science relatively sparsely, if at all, especially in an instance like this. Where I would go with this is, again, something very personal. Make it personal, you know? Well, I'm really glad that this vegetarian framework works really well for you, but I've been doing some experimentation because I've been having some issues with my health. Here are maybe some of the things that were going on, and you can kind of explain some of the struggles or what led you to trying to make some dietary changes. So I've had these struggles. So I've been doing a little experimentation and I'm adding some, you know, really well, uh, naturally raised and fed organic seafood and some more eggs and maybe a little bit of meat back into my diet. And I feel a lot better. I do. My energy is getting better. I feel like I'm sleeping better. It's helping with this or that medical condition. And because, you know, I know that you're really focused on eating wholesome, nutrient-dense food, and I am too, and because, you know, I feel like I'm including all of that stuff still in my diet, I'm eating lots and lots of plants, I just think that I've reached a, a really good healthy balance for me. So, you know, I think it's great that 
the vegetarian lifestyle that you're doing is working really well for you. This is just working really, really well for me right now. And I think from a church perspective, I'm, I'm familiar with Seventh-day Seventh -day Adventist, which also has kind of a, a root in a vegetarian framework. And, you know, I might say something like, I feel like I'm really listening to my body and taking care of my body the way God or the Bible recommends. And then again, continue to focus on the things you have in common. You're both, you know, focused on eating really healthy, taking good care of your body, eating lots of vegetables and fruit. And so reassuring them that from a personal standpoint, you feel like you're really doing a good job in taking care of that based on the tenets of your religion may be a good way to just sort of, it's a way to push back without actually pushing back, if that makes sense. Yeah. Hi. Hi. So I have kids from a previous marriage, and so I call them mixed kitchen kids. One week, we do one week on, one week off. So one week, they eat the way I eat hesitantly, um, and sometimes with, you know, jokes, ugh, does this have coconut in it again? Um, <laughs> and then the other week, they eat pretty unhealthy. Um, and the 13 year old is pretty, you know, um, apprehensive about my style of eating. So what would you suggest knowing that I can't control uh, how they eat the weeks they are not with me? Right. That's a difficult one. So she's saying basically, you know, her kids are half with her, half with their dad. Uh, they eat super, pretty unhealthily at their dad's. They eat pretty healthy with me, although reluctantly. And I totally understand that because if you go to dad's and it's all like party, party, you know, anything you want to eat, candy and, and cereal and everything, it's not going to be super fun to come to mom's and have a lot of coconut. So I understand. So I think you're at a good place where you've understood that you can't um, control everything and to try to is like lunacy. So understand that when they're with you, of course, you're in control of their food choices as much as you are, given that they're teenagers. With kids, it's a little bit harder because you can't speak to them like you would an adult. You know, you can't look at your friend and say like, hey, you, you know how you had dairy and now your skin's breaking out? There may be an association there. Like kids just want to eat what they want to eat. I like to use an awareness tool with kids to help them see for themselves how their eating impacts things like their behavior, their attention span, maybe how often they're in trouble in school or at home. So if you can point out very gently some of the distinctions between the behavior you observe in them after they get back from their carba palooza at dad's with the behavior they exhibit when they're eating with you. Hey, you know, it's really, I know it's not like the funnest thing ever, but boy, don't you tend to have more energy when you're home with me? And I notice that you don't get into as many fights with your sister when you're here. And I think that has something to do with the fact that, you know, you're not eating some of these foods that may be kind of irritating. And, um, your teachers say you pay attention in school a lot better when you're, you know, coming in with a really good lunch as opposed to a lunch of like a candy bar and Doritos may help them make that association for themselves. It's tricky with kids because when they leave the house, of course, when they're at school, they're going to gonna kind of do what you want to do. But understand you can't control everything. Do the best you can while they're there. Involve them in the process as much as you can. So you may want them to eat broccoli, but if they don't love broccoli, but they'll do cauliflower, like, cool, go with that. And then try to make an association with them between what you're observing in terms of behavior. With kids, a lot of it's behavior. It could also be digestion. It could be skin at that age. Kids are vain at that age. So you point out things like, hey, when you eat this, I notice you got a breakout and that's not so good for your big date coming up. That may help to make a connection as well. Yeah. Um, I love the whole 30. Oh, Hi, thank Melissa. you. And um, I've been reading a lot in the media, and some of the things that people do sometimes is send you on your timeline in Facebook things for you to read as a way of expressing their concern of some of the criticism. Oh, sure. So one of the things that are coming a lot in the blogosphere is the topic of orthorexia, ner orthorexia nervosa. And they link uh, to some of the whole 30 or vegan or raw. So what is your emotional and response mm. to to that very controversial and real yeah. topic. That makes me wish I had Dr. Emily Deans up here because she's a psychiatrist who's written very effectively about this. The question is essentially, I have friends and family concerned for me because the subject of orthorexia keeps coming up and when you look at Whole30, it looks really restrictive, it looks really intense. How do you kind of assuage their fears? That's a difficult one because again, a lot of that is probably coming from an emotional response. The way I think about it is there's a difference between having a glass of wine and having a glass of wine as an alcoholic. Like not everybody who drinks a glass of wine is an alcoholic, not everybody who pays attention to their health falls into orthorexia. So I think there's a, a kind of fine line and we've written some articles about how to determine if your whole 30 is maybe heading into less healthy territory. So 
you know, you can ask yourself these questions and explain some of the differences to them. It's something like, um, you know, if you find you are terrified to go off plan, like say you get a salad and that salad has croutons and you freak out and instead of just picking off the croutons, like you don't have celiac, you know, it's just a preference, but instead of picking off the croutons, you send the whole salad back and you freak out that they're going to use the same dish and maybe there's some gluten in the dish. That tells me maybe you've crossed into less healthy territory. So understanding some of these concerns where maybe you're restricting the program even more than it already is for reasons other than your health um, tells me that maybe, you know, you're venturing into that less healthy territory. So you can explain to family and friends, you know, the principles behind this orthorexia is that people get really, they get so caught up in that they're afraid to eat anything else and it becomes kind of obsessive for them where they're thinking about food all the time so much. And that's not at all where I am with my Whole30. You know, the reason I'm sticking with this way of eating is because I've discovered that when I eat these foods, this negative effect happens. You can kind of think about it like an allergy right? Like if I were allergic to peanuts, I just wouldn't eat peanuts. Well, some of these foods make me feel so bad that I'm just choosing not to eat them. And I, you know, I think that kind of makes sense, but I'm not obsessive about it. And I'm not thinking about food all the time. And when something delicious comes along, I'm going to, you know, evaluate whether it's worth it and I'm going to enjoy it. And remember this whole 30 experiment is only 30 days. You know, it's not something I'm going to do for the rest of my life. It's just a 30 day kind of scientific intervention to help me identify food sensitivities. So I understand that you're worried, but I promise I'm, I'm staying in a really good, healthy place with this. And at the end of the 30 days, I get to reintroduce. And then I can take what I've learned with me into this really sustainable, healthy, more relaxed lifestyle for the rest of my life. Hi. Hi. I have a question for you. What if you have a spouse that is like a junk food junkie uh -huh. and everywhere you turn in the kitchen, you're seeing tempting foods? Yeah, that's uh, really hard. Do you recommend like saying, I, I will hope that you'll, uh, if you don't want to join me on this journey, uh, would you be willing to divide the pantry into like his and hers? Or, yep, that's like, great. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good start. So she's like, you know, if I'm doing the Whole30 and I've got a spouse at home who's a real junk food junkie and everywhere I'm turning around, there's, you know, food everywhere that I'm going to find really tempting, that's going to be very difficult. So the first thing that you want to do is have this conversation well ahead of you taking on the Whole30 program. You want to do it so that it's, again, you're not right in the middle of it, especially not in the first week, because that can be really intense emotion. Emotionally. Sit down ahead of time. You're going to have the conversation we just talked about. Here's what I'm going to be doing. Here's why it's really, really important to me. Here's what I need from you. And here's where you talk about, you know, it's going to be really, really hard for me to avoid some of the junk food. Is it okay if I just give you your own drawer down here and we just move all your stuff down here so I don't have to see it every single time I'm pulling out the coconut oil? That's a good place to start. It's having the, it's again, having the discussion of, um, please don't offer me some of these foods, like even, you know, because it might be really hard for me to say no, I'm struggling. It may be a discussion about here's how dinner time's going to go. If you are the one preparing the food, if you're the primary food shopper and the food cooker, then you better have a discussion about, okay, like all this junk food, I'm not going to buy that for you at the grocery store. You know, if you want to pick that stuff up, you can. Or I'm willing to buy it for you, but I'm not going to cook it for you. Or here's how I'm going to make dinner. I'm going to make one meal and you're going to eat it and that's going to be it. Or if you want to add your, you know, I'm going to make a whole 30 meal, but if you want to add bread or rice or pasta as a side, you can feel free to do that. Let them know what expectations you have going forward so you can come to an agreement on that ahead of time. So that day one of your whole 30 doesn't roll around and you've made a compliant meal and your spouse is like, wait, I really wanted pasta with this and you're like too bad and now you're having this kind of difficult interaction because you haven't discussed it up front. So again, planning and preparation are key, but a lot of times the planning isn't just about what food you're going to eat. It's going to how it's how you're going to interact with that food with the people in your household. Those are all really good places to start, though. Okay, so adolescent uh, adolescents. Uh, there's an 11 year old boy, my friend's son, who has gone gluten free because he has sensitivities to it. So his lunch at school, all the kids have noticed. They have found out not because he was talking about it that he's gluten free. And now he's getting teased and a little bit bullied, actually. So he's kind of done the thing about not talking about it and just moves on. But it's not working. So any other advice or resources that you would recommend? Oh, that's so hard. I'm definitely, bullying is such a difficult subject, and I'm definitely not an expert in that. So he's coming to, he's coming to school with 
not normal looking lunches? Is that the, are the kids noticing he doesn't have a sandwich or? Yeah, that's a really difficult one. I mean, I guess as a parent, you could go the route of, I'm gonna make his lunch look as normal as possible and just keep it gluten-free. So there are gluten-free bread options and such. That might be an option, and unless he has a sensitivity to some of those other things too. You know, when it comes to kids, well, anyway, that might be an option. I, that's a tough one. I'd really have to think about how to respond to that from the child's perspective, because kids are so unpredictable. You can't rationalize with them. It's not logical like an adult. So let me noodle on that. And if you see me walking around, I'll tell you if I come up with something. That's a tough one. Are we good? OK, we have time for one more question. What's a good way to respond to someone who is really trying to be helpful? So for example, I've got many food sensitivities and someone said, look, I made you this, it's gluten free. Well, it's got nine other things that I can't have, mm. but I don't want to be rude. Yeah. Um, and then it keeps happening and you know, it's. Yeah, it keeps happening because you don't want to be rude. <laughs> right. Right. right, no, I know, I know. So <clears throat> the question is like, I have a lot of sensitivities and people try to be helpful. So they give me some food and they say like, oh, this is gluten free, but there's nine other things in there that I can't have. And when you say can't, I imagine that it's an actual sensitivity, not just a preference. So there are things that I prefer not to eat, but if I were to eat it, it wouldn't really have to like a noticeable negative impact. You have to decide your context. If someone makes you something, and again, it's kind of one of those like, oh, it's a strong preference, you have to think about what's more important here, maintaining this preference or not offending this person. If you have a legitimate sensitivity, you should never feel bad about saying, I'm, I really appreciate that, that's such a kind gesture. I haven't been super upfront about all of my sensitivities, but unfortunately I can't eat this, this, or this either. You know, when I do, I have a pretty serious health reaction. So I really appreciate the effort, but unfortunately I'm gonna have to pass. And you have to do that, and it's tough, and the person might be a little, they're probably gonna feel bad, you know, because they didn't know and they've made this gesture but that's how it doesn't keep happening again, you know? So being really upfront about it, letting them know that it's an actual sensitivity, here's, and you don't have to go into graphic detail, but here's what happens. You know, if you made someone a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and you gave it to them and they said, oh, I'm allergic to peanuts, you'd be like, oh, I'm really sorry, I didn't know. So it's really the same kind of context. It's just not quite as well accepted as an, an actual allergy. So be upfront, thank them very much, but don't compromise your health just so someone else's feelings aren't hurt, because again, that's kind of not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to yourself. If it's not an actual sensitivity or an allergy and it's just a strong preference, then you're just gonna have to make that call. You know, I, I wrote an article about Whole30 versus hurting grandma's feelings. A woman in the middle of her Whole30 went to lunch at her grandparents and they made her something that wasn't totally compliant and she only sees them very every once in a while and she decided to break her Whole30 to sit and enjoy this meal with her grandparents. And that's a, a choice that you have to make individually based on your context and how this food impacts you and your relationship with this person. So, yeah. Are we good? All right, thank you guys very much. I really had a good time with this. Thanks. <laughs>